that reminded me. I don't know if I ever told you guys, or a few of you know, uh, when I was going to preach my first sermon here, uh, which was my preaching my first sermon ever, actually, it was kind of funny. On the way here, Victoria's, like, one of Victoria's uh, car tires literally just, like, imploded. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess all the stories about the enemy not liking the word <laughs> kind of panned out. But, all right, so, uh, before we start today, uh, if you'll join me one more time uh, for a word of prayer. Dear God, I thank you for this day. Uh, once again, I thank you for everyone that is here listening. Uh, I beg you to please just uh, speak to us uh, through your word and uh, speak, uh, uh, have the Holy Spirit speak through me as well as we uh, uh, go ahead and, and look through your word together on this topic of conforming to scripture. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, this is a topic that's been on my mind uh, for quite a while. Uh, not just seeing how much society keeps kind of going in the direction of relativity, right, going, or subjectivity, rather, going in the direction of, well, you know, uh, I can have my truth, which is completely antithetical to your truth, but somehow we're both still correct, right? And so uh, not only that, but also given how divisive of a year this has been um, for a lot of people and a lot of churches, uh, even for my uh, home church in Florida, uh, had a really rough time this year, uh, ended up actually kind of falling apart overall just because of all the uh, political divisiveness and all the other things that are going on. And so uh, with that kind of weighing heavy on my heart, I, I was thinking that, you know, this is a, a great topic for us to go through. And it's one that I believe is quintessential uh, if we're going to be, uh, number one, if we're going to be Christians, and number two, uh, if we're going to continue being an effective church. And so what is this sermon not going to be? So it's not going to be a robust defense of why the Bible is the Word of God. That is something that is really important. That's something that I love talking about, something that I love discussing, and it's something that we could have a whole series of sermons on. Uh, uh, and I'd love to talk about it with anybody here that, that wants to talk about it. But for the purposes of this sermon, we're just going to agree that the Bible is the Word of God. Um, and so with that, so why should we care about Scripture at all? right? So if we actually look at Proverbs chapter 9, uh, verse 10, it says, the, it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now notice what this verse doesn't say. It doesn't say for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of religious wisdom. It doesn't say and the knowledge of the Holy One is religious understanding, right? And why am I making that differentiation? Because oftentimes we, we like to think, okay, you know what? Yeah, if it's, a it's, if it's a matter like prayer, if it's a matter like going to church, if it's a uh, some kind of moral matter. Oh, then I'll go to God. Then I'll go to the Bible. And we actually usually tend to go there first, uh, hopefully. But what we don't realize is that this verse, and, and we're going to go through a myriad of other ones, say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. It's the beginning of all understanding. That's not just religious understanding or wisdom. That's everything. That and that includes science, math, politics, uh, how we treat our family members, how we treat people around us. It includes everything. And so if we don't go to the actual fount of all wisdom and knowledge, what are we doing? Especially as Christians. And so it's important that we realize that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so how do we even know what the fear of the Lord means? How do we begin to uh, search uh, for the Lord's wisdom? By going through his scriptures. And so Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36 I say this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And so we get another piece of the puzzle here. Why should we care about scripture at all? The reason why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is because he made everything. Right? Notice that last verse. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So when we're doing anything, whether it's our, our trying to figure out our position on politics, trying to figure out uh, how to view uh, science, how to view math, how to, how to view our interpersonal relationships, insert literally any topic here, the Lord's word is final because he designed everything. <laughs> You know, if, 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 if we're talking about an engineer that designs some kind of, you know, uh, well, anything, a bridge or something, let me tell you, I'd much rather you go to an engineer to figure out how that, how that bridge works and how much weight it can support than go to someone like me that knows absolutely nothing about that. And oftentimes we kind of just skip over God because we're like, oh, yeah, yeah you know, I mean, yeah, I've learned how to pray and stuff from God. I've learned how to treat other people. But please, this is an ancient book when it comes to everything else. <laughs> 
You know, and, and oftentimes, and, and, and I include myself in that, sometimes we like to think that we know better than God when, when we talk about these things. And if we're honest with ourselves, that's the reason why we don't consult him on most of the things that we decide to do, right? And so what is today's core truth? Today's core truth is this. True conformity with scripture is characterized by a commitment to properly contextualized biblical truth, humility, and love. And so we'll, we'll and, and it, it's important because it's a combination. It's not either of these three. Because if you only go with love, then you end up in this position of subjectivity. Because I love this person so much, I never want to contradict anything they say because I don't want to hurt their feelings. If you only stick uh, to humility, you'll never actually uh, uh, speak up and try to help anybody else. So you're just going to say, man, I mean, I'm so horrible. I, there's no way I can preach the gospel to anybody. If you're missing uh, properly contextualized biblical truth, then you can't do anything when it, when it comes to preaching the word to anybody. Right? And, and you can't do anything even for, for um, getting closer to God yourself if you don't know uh, properly contextualized scripture. And so with that, the questions that I want everyone here to think through, which is, are the same questions that I was thinking through when making this sermon, are these. Do you find yourself conforming to Scripture daily, or do you find yourself attempting to conform Scripture to yourself? And it's very important, because there's a very key difference uh, between these two. Namely, what is being changed? Uh, whether it's yourself, your mind, your own thoughts, or whether you're trying to twist Scripture to fit you, and trying to basically change God to look a little bit more like you. And so, uh, with that, uh, the first truth that we're going to talk about is that there are multiple ways to conform to Scripture incorrectly. Uh, and in reality, that just means not conforming at all. And so, with that, we're going to look through uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And this is Jesus speaking, and it says, or we're speaking about Jesus, it says, Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so I think this is a perfect example, uh, and, and we'll talk about all the different ways in which this applies to not just conforming ourselves to Scripture, but also our attitudes uh, with other people, and, and when we try uh, to make them conform to Scripture. Um, and so uh, the first wrong way of conforming to Scripture is refusing to do it at all. And so the first thing that we see here with this Pharisee is that had this Pharisee been reading <laughs> the Old Testament, had he been reading Scripture, he would have realized that he himself needed forgiveness from God. And yet, that's not at all what he's doing. And keep in mind, the title of Pharisee, this is supposed to be a teacher of the law. This is somebody who's supposed to know the Old Testament uh, forward and backward. right? And so, notice what uh, the book of Hosea has to say in chapter 4, verse 6. And just for a little bit of context, uh, the book of Hosea was written because God's people, and not even just like the lay people, but God's priesthood, who were supposed to be leading the people in how to conform with Scripture, decided they were going to instead forget their covenant with God that he made with them after uh, leading them out of Egypt, and they were basically going to do their own thing. And this is what God has to say. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have, notice, rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. And so oftentimes we like to think, oh, you know what, I can, I can play fast and lose with God because God is so patient and God is so loving and God is just so good to me. But oftentimes what we end up doing is just, not even just neglecting our relationship, but actively rejecting God. And then we still expect him to just keep coming through on his end of the promise. Which, praise be to God, he still does that a lot of the time. Um, but just because he comes through for us doesn't mean that we're actually coming through for him. Just like the people of Israel here. And so the reason why... Um, I uh, bolded the, the, the word rejected and forgotten. It's because this isn't like some passive thing. This isn't like, oh, because you didn't read into my law. Or, no, 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 because you, you kind of like neglected to look at it. No, this is because you actively rejected my law. This is because you chose to forget my law. And this is something that is even better exemplified in Romans chapter 1. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And notice this last verse, uh, it's not just talking about making a little statue of, of some kind of serpent or, or what have you and, and worshiping it. It's trying to change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And what, and what did we say earlier? When we decide that we're just going to absolutely forego the law of God, when we decide we're not even going to look at his scripture for, for guidance, we have, we're trying to change the glory of that incorruptible God into an image that is literally just us. That is our sinful self. That is the way that we want to treat people. The opinions that I want to have. The things that I want to accomplish. And what we end up doing is we end up making an idol of ourselves. And that is what the Pharisee did here. Because had the Pharisee noticed at all what Scripture had to say, had he not chosen to reject God's word in his heart, he wouldn't have been in this position where instead of he himself pouring his heart out before God, he was instead just looking at this guy, at what he probably considered to be this poor sap praying next to him. And so... That leads us to what is the, the second wrong way of conforming to Scripture, and that is conforming Scripture to your own beliefs. And let's see what the New Testament has to say about this. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. And so oftentimes what we like to do is we like to basically say, all right, God, I've made up my mind on all of this. Now, please give me some Bible verses to support my opinion, <laughs> right? And instead of, instead of going to the Bible and saying, God, what would you have me do? What would you have me believe? What would you have me stand up for? We just decide, you know what, God, I've decided that today I'm going to stand up for this. I have no clue if you like it or not, but I hope you do because, I mean, you know, I've, we're, we're beyond the point of no return. Uh, and so how wrong is it for us to do that? Right? And so what's that, what Paul is saying here in 2 Timothy is that the time will come, and, and, and again, this is something that, that Paul and all the apostles dealt with in their time, which is constantly trying to talk, or, or having to write letters, if I remember correctly, um, uh, Paul's uh, uh, first and second letter to the, Corinth, to the church in Corinth uh, regards this, right? Because there were people that showed up, uh, we call them, quote-unquote, super apostles, that were basically just telling the people everything they wanted to hear. They were saying, hey, forget Paul. I mean, what he's saying, does that really make any sense? No, and then they just started stroking their egos. And it got to the point where Paul had to write them this letter to say, like, what are you guys doing? Why are you forfeiting what's actually the word of God for some nonsense? And so if we're honest with ourselves, even though we like to think that it's mainly unbelievers that do this, that it's mainly, oftentimes I find that not just I myself, but also my brothers and sisters in Christ, are guilty of doing the same thing. We make up our mind on all kinds of stuff, and we decide that we're going to speak first and then worry about if God cares about it later, or, or maybe not even worry about it at all. And so I actually have two examples, uh, two personal examples of this. Um, so uh, I, w without, without naming uh, anybody, uh, my family and I, uh, when we first came to the United States, we spent quite a few years in Miami before moving to uh, Boca, and then <laughs> I you know, moved here. But while we were in Miami, the first church that we went to, um, it was really in, 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 a, in a really impoverished area. There were a lot of people that needed help, a lot of people that struggled to pay the bills every month. Uh, and even sometimes that was my family as well, included in those people. And uh, uh, I was very young, so I remember this as my parents told me. But there was this guy at church who, uh, the company that he worked for, essentially had a lot of canned food, a lot of things that they, that they uh, moved around and sold. And whenever a can was dented or something like that, uh, they just, it wasn't fit to put on the shelf, and so he could literally take it to any, any charity that he wanted. It's not that the food was bad, it's just that it wasn't fit for, you know, it wasn't pretty enough to put on the shelf. And so when my parents found out about this, uh, that guy, my parents, and a few other people said, hey, why don't we put together a food drive uh, to help this community? Right? There's a lot of people that are struggling. And when they went to one of the pastors, he said, haven't you read the Bible? The Bible says that the poor will be with us always. So... No, we're not doing that. We just got to worry in bringing people like us to this church. And let me show you, just, just so we can put it into perspective, because I know what verse he was quoting. It was this one right here. <laughs> and, let me, and, and so let, let's see why he was wrong, uh, first of all, and, and, and how that applies to us. So it says this, 
Uh, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had uh, who had who he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. And so to someone that doesn't, is not familiar with these verses, to someone that, is, that, that maybe hasn't read these verses at all, hearing that, they would have been misled. Right now, uh, I would venture to say that, that, that a preacher of the word uh, should probably understand these verses in context, uh, given that they're kind of self-explanatory. Uh, but that's not even the point. The point here is that oftentimes, what we decide is, I'm going to come up with my own thing, like I said. And so what that pastor had decided was, hey, I don't particularly care about the poor. I mean, I'm well off. I want people here that are well off as well. Uh, so, hey, well, what can we find in Scripture? And he just pulls out of this whole uh, a set of verses, he pulls this last one completely out of context, not even the full thing, just a part of it, and says, there we go, now I can justify what I believe. And even though to us that may seem horrible, it, it may seem disgusting, I would venture to say that some of us do this almost daily. I would say that a lot of us, uh, and if we're honest with ourselves, we've probably done this on numerous occasions where we say, hey, you know, I have this opinion, and someone uh, puts us against the wall, and we just say, uh, uh, I remember this verse from, you know, uh, this book of the Bible, and we don't care about the context. We don't care about what it actually has to say. All we care about is how we can manipulate it to serve our own end. Uh, and I'll give you another example, uh, which is uh, even worse than, than this one. Uh, uh, another personal example that I have, uh, again, for, for those of you that don't know, I mentioned it earlier, uh, my family and I came from Venezuela a little bit over 10 years ago, I believe almost 11 at this point. Um, and so having come here uh, uh, from Venezuela, we've had a long uh, and complex, to say the least, 10 years of going from immigration office to immigration office, talking with an uh, uh, ICE officer to ICE officer, and doing all these different things for a long time. And so, that, and so something like uh, uh, how other immigrants are treated is very near and dear to my family, because we've been through that. And so I've had people, uh, and there's one, it's, it's happened a couple of times, so there's one example that really comes to mind. Uh, who, and, 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 and by the way, this is a, a, a brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is a guy that uh, went to a Bible study that I used to go to in Florida, who came up to me and made, told me that he could make an argument from Scripture as to why people like my family and I shouldn't be here. He said that he could do that. And if you'll notice, this is blank, because it turns out there was no Scripture to support that. <laughs> there really wasn't. But uh, even this is, this is, in a lot of ways, even worse than the previous example. And this is something that I think a lot of us also are, are, are guilty of doing, where we say, we speak first, we're like, oh, I'm sure the Bible has somewhere, you know, I'm sure God backs me up on this one somewhere. And we don't even have a verse to misquote because there isn't one. And so as kind of a, a, a really silly <laughs> of an example as that was, um, I would venture to say that we do that a lot more often than we'd like to admit. And so what's important for us to remember, and I have a quote here uh, from a really theologically sound preacher, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen J. Lawson says this, we do not sit in authority over Scripture, the Scripture sits in authority over us. And so whether, again, whether it has to do with politics, whether it has to do with how we treat somebody else, whether it has to do with, uh, like we're seeing with the Pharisee, with our own standing with God, it's important that we don't make up the things that we want to believe and think about God later. It's not, it's, it's not a matter of just forgetting what God has to say overall. It's realizing, wow, Scripture is an authority over me. I, I, man, I want to find out what God has for me. And so part of understanding this is understanding that what God has for us to stand up for, what God has for us to believe, is far better than what, anything that we could come up with. Right? Notice the verse that we read before in Romans chapter 1, uh, uh, sorry, in uh, um, uh, Luke, I believe, um, where it's, or sorry, Romans, yeah, uh, where it says the riches of God's wisdom, how unsearchable are his ways. These are riches, right? This is not supposed to be a bad thing. And often we begrudgingly decide like, okay, sure, I'll see what scripture has to say. Maybe I'll change my mind here. Maybe I won't dare. And 
when we do that, we're missing the entire point, which is that what God has for us is far, far better than anything anybody else can offer. Uh, in fact, in, in the Old Testament, uh, um, uh, God, one of, the, one of the charges that God brings up uh, uh, against Israel, which there's, there's plenty of them, but one of them at a certain point in history is that he says that by going after idols of other nations, by going after these practices, by going after the so-called wisdom of these pagan nations, that they have chosen to forego the fountain of living water for broken cisterns that can't even hold water. And how often do we say, you know what, I mean, I really like this cistern, <laughs> you know? Or, hey, you know what, maybe I can fix this thing. And I'm sure it'll hold some water eventually when we have an entire fountain next to us. And so what's important is once we understand this, and this is key, if you find that your personal opinion disagrees with Scripture, then it is time to change your mind. Uh, and this is one of my favorite quotes from one of my uh, uh, old pastors uh, in my old church, uh, uh, Sandy Hunts, uh, Huntsman. And uh, he said this on numerous occasions, and it always stuck out to me, because uh, there's been plenty of times uh, and I'm sure I, I'll, I'll be a witness to that. I'm sure Aaron will say the same thing, where there's things that I was taught about the Bible, and there's things that I was taught about life, plenty of them, uh, that I was like holding on to dearly, and then someone came up and asked me, like, where actually is that in Scripture? And I said, oh, I'll show you. And then I looked it up, and I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> I, guess, I guess Scripture showed me. But what's important is that we have this attitude of, hey, not only like, oh, I have to begrudgingly change. No, it's, oh, I'm so glad that I know this now. I'm so glad that I have God's word to be instructed from. I'm so happy that I get to change my mind. And so uh, with that, uh, the uh, uh, third wrong way of, con of conforming to Scripture is conforming to Scripture for the sole purpose of appearing more holy than others in order to hold it over their head. And notice, going back to the parable we were talking about, this is exactly what the Pharisee does, right? Uh, we'll see here in Psalm uh, 14, verses 2 through 3, which the Pharisee should have known, uh, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have, to go, they have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. If the Pharisee, instead of looking at this guy and saying, thank you, dear God, that I'm not like this poor sinner, if he had actually gone to God's word, if he had gone there not for the purpose of appearing more holy than this guy, not for the purpose of holding it over this guy's head, if he had actually gone to Scripture memorized a psalm like this, memorized the variety of other verses like this, he would have been right next to him saying, God, please have mercy on me, a sinner. And so it's important that when it comes to our dealing with other people as well, or even our own personal life, that we don't go to Scripture just so we can appear more holy, but so that we can actually become more holy in our walk with Christ. And so uh, now that we've talked about <laughs> all the wrong ways of conforming to Scripture, truth number two is that there is a right way to conform ourselves to Scripture. And so that is characterized by humility before a holy God. And notice once again, as we were saying, the tax collector says here, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Keep in mind that when we decide, wow, I'm so good. <laughs> When we decide, I'm such a good Christian, that is absolutely repulsive to anybody that wants to listen, right? When we go up to somebody and we're like, hey, listen, you need the gospel because you're not as good as someone like me, right? When we say that, no one's going to listen. And primarily the reason why they won't listen is because that's not the gospel, right? The gospel is a message of humility before a holy God because we know how sinful we are. And we're humble before him, not just because we're sinful, but because he's so gracious that he sent his one and only son to come die on our behalf and to be raised again. And so if we keep those things in mind, we can be just like this tax collector, going to the Lord in prayer, saying, Lord, help me to humble myself. Help me to see others the way that you want me to see them. And also, even more importantly than that, help me to see myself the way that you see me, a sinner that needs Christ continually. Not just in the moment that I get saved, but as I go through my process of sanctification, I continually need Christ. I'm never in a moment where I'm above that, right? And so when we're going to look at uh, here uh, the last truth, truth number three, there's a right way of helping others conform to Scripture. Now, when we talk about humility, when we talk about Scripture, it's very easy for us to say, man, and rightfully so, I'm such a sinner, I need Christ, I'm nobody to go tell somebody else how to live. But what we don't realize is that when we just keep quiet about the gospel, when we just let somebody else believe their truth, quote-unquote, as opposed to the truth, when we do that, we're not helping them. 
and there's a right way to help them. Not everything is, is an insult, not everything is repulsive. There's a right way to help others conform to Scripture. And so a, a verse that gets thrown out all the time, I'm sure you've heard it, maybe in the past uh, uh, you've used it as well, uh, uh, which is, I think this is one of the most misquoted uh, uh, set of Bible verses ever, uh, with the, which is Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Uh, and this is Jesus speaking, says this, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and normally people stop there. <laughs> but what this verse says is, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So the reason why a lot of people misquote this is they say, hey, who are you to judge me? Right? You got a plank in your own eye. Like, leave me alone. But that's not what this verse is saying. It's saying if you're, if you're being someone like this Pharisee, where you don't even realize how sinful you are, if you don't even realize how sinful you are, how are you going to go explain to somebody else how sinful they are? That doesn't make sense. And so what, what this is saying is, hey, you need to first take that plank out of your own eye. You need to allow Jesus to take that plank out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly enough to help your brother take the speck out of his. And so what that means is, hey, sometimes you have to have an uncomfortable conversation. Sometimes you have to tell someone, hey, you know what, I struggled with the same thing as you. I had a plank in my own eye. Not by my own doing, but because of Christ. This plank is no longer in my eye. Let me help you take the speck out of yours. And notice how much, or <laughs> notice how different that is from, hey, you see this thing in my eye? Yeah, it's not there. Let me tell you how to get that thing out of your own eye. So the point of this, uh, of this verse, and we're going to see um, in a second as well, even Jesus' own example uh, in, in doing this, is that we need to be, yes, humble, be really knowledgeable in Scripture, but at the same time, be loving, right? Because the, the thing is, in all reality, like, like most things in Scripture, these three, these three go hand in hand. Because when you know God's Word, that's going to humble you. It's going to make you say, man, who am I, <laughs> you know, in, in, in light of the Gospel? And then once you understand, like, wow, who am I, and then you see Jesus save someone as as horrible of a sinner as you, it makes you say, wow, I want to share this love with everyone. I want to share this truth that changed my life. And so let's see the example that Jesus gives. Uh, I know that seems like a, uh, quite a bit of text. Uh, but it says this in John chapter 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so there's a couple of things to note here. So Jesus not once denies that this woman was actually caught in adultery. Because he knows that she was. Right? Not once does he tell them, no, the law of Moses is wrong. This, this, this kind of sin deserves no punishment. He doesn't say that either. But what he tells them is basically, who are you to try to stone her? I notice the oldest leave first, probably because they had way more years of a conscience built up. And they were like, yeah, there's no way I can, I can do this. And then the youngest leave. And notice, when she's left alone with Jesus, and this is something that we miss a lot of the time, is Jesus being holy and without sin is the only one that could have actually stoned her. If he wanted to stone her, he could have. And he wouldn't have been in the wrong. But instead, I notice, even, this, even the, the most minute details, and I love, that's why I love this story, when he says, woman, where, where are your accusers, or where are those accusers of yours? We translated woman. The actual term that's being used is kind of more similar to my lady, or ma'am. It's a term of respect, of endearment. It's one that Jesus actually uses uh, uh, talking to his own mother uh, earlier in the Gospel. And so notice, even though she's guilty of this, even though Jesus can stone her, he instead comes up and with a term of endearment says, my lady, where are your accusers? From the beginning, he shows her love. This is a woman that was just dragged out here to be killed. She thought she was going to be dead. 
and Jesus comes up to her, and instead of, and notice, he is going to do that because he does it the next line, but instead of just hitting her with scripture and saying, like, how dare you, he first comes up and says, my lady, where are your accusers? He's being comforting to her. He's being loving to her. And notice, however, that the story doesn't end there. And a lot of the times we'd like for the story, we'd like one of two things. Either we'd like for the story to end there, and we don't have to have a hard conversation with somebody, or sometimes we'd actually prefer if the story went completely differently, and she was stoned. You know? At least if our, if our attitudes towards other people are, have anything to say about it. That's often how we'd like the story to end. But notice, Jesus doesn't stop it there. He doesn't allow, allow them to stone her. He doesn't stone her himself. But he has this conversation, which I'm sure was still uh, an uncomfortable one with her. After she says, no one, Lord, Jesus says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He doesn't say, I don't condemn you. Go on and live your truth. Right? He says, I don't condemn you, but go out and sin no more. This is not something that you can continue doing. This is not something that's good for you. This is not something that's good in the sight of a holy God. Do not do this. But before he got to that message, he covered it with love. And that's something that we miss a lot of the time. Uh, and, and so in light of that, uh, one of the things I want to end here with, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, apologists of all time. He had a, a, a huge ministry because uh, he himself uh, was an ex-Muslim. Um, and so he had a huge ministry uh, reaching out to people um, uh, uh, that, are, uh, in, that believe in Islam. And so he said this, evangelism is more than memorizing facts and apologetic arguments. Sometimes it's enough to simply be a friend who cares and asks questions. Now, once again, even in this quote, notice, and this is someone who lived his entire life after he, after he got saved, constantly having these conversations with people, having really tough conversations, going to apologetics conferences, having debates, and he says, yes, well, these things are important. Sometimes it's enough to simply be a friend who cares and asks questions. And the reason why he says that is because if you, if you actually listen to his testimony, that's what happened with him. He had a friend who was really knowledgeable in Scripture, but a friend who cared for him and was there for him and was willing to ask tough questions. Even when he was appointed in his, in, in his life, where now he was really unsure of this belief in Islam that he always had, his friend didn't immediately stop asking questions. Oh, I don't want him to be uncomfortable. No, he kept asking him those questions, but in a loving way, in a way that let him know that he cared for him, in a way that let him know that, which by the way, he ended up losing his family for coming to Christ, because they, they absolutely are disassociated with him. And his friend never tr treated that flippantly. It was always, I know how much you're going to lose, but I'm here for you. And more importantly, Christ is here for you. Uh, and so with that, uh, if everyone can uh, do me a favor and close your eyes and, and, and bow your heads. Um, if listening to this sermon, uh, just like I did when writing it, if you felt that maybe you've been guilty of not conforming yourself to Scripture, or maybe even approaching other people in a way that's not glorifying to God, uh, if you'll raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you. Thank you. If maybe listening to this, you realized uh, that you've done nothing more than, quote unquote, play the Christian game, that you thought you were saved, and maybe now listening to all of this, it sounds like you're lining up more with the Pharisee in the parable than the tax collector. Uh, if you'd raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you. And uh, with that being said, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, just your word. I thank you for how willing you are, dear God, to just continue lovingly correcting uh, a wretch like me. I beg you to please uh, just be with everyone today that, that raised their hand. Maybe uh, everyone today that maybe didn't want to raise their hand, Lord God, but you know their heart. I beg you to please be with all of those uh, who have recognized that they haven't been representing you correctly. Uh, be with all of those, dear God, who maybe have realized that their own walk with you is not as good as, as they thought it was. I beg you, please just help them, Lord God, lovingly correct them uh, in the same way that you've lovingly correct, corrected me a countless amount of times, the same way that you lovingly corrected the adulterous woman in this story. I beg you, please just be with us, be with any here uh, within, within the reach of my voice that maybe don't know you. I beg you, please just uh, stir up their heart, stir up their conscience, dear God, and just help them to uh, be in a place where they want to receive the free gift of salvation. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.